on today's busy Friday evening broadcast of the Locked on Hawks podcast. The Hawks have been busy in the last couple of days with regard to national news. There was a front office turmoil story that we'll touch on on today's show. And then importantly from there, the Hawks pulled one out of the fire on Friday night, winning at the last second on tipping by John Collins. Uh, Not a perfect game by any means. We'll get into all of what transpired in that game, big picture and more coming up. You are locked on Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1389 of the Locked On Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Rowland, coming to you on a Friday evening into Saturday on January 13th into 14th. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs helps you find the most qualified candidates that you want to talk to, and they help you to do it faster. Post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on MBA. I also want to encourage you to make this podcast, Locked on Hawks, of course, your first listen each and every day. Check us out across podcast platforms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Odyssey, Tune in radio, Google Play, all that fun stuff on the audio side. And then we're also on YouTube over on the video side. And it isn't often I talk about something other than a game first on the podcast. I'm gonna I'm going to lead with the Sam Amick of story from the Athletic on Friday that was certainly national news, much less no local news on the Hawks. Before I do that, though, we'll get into the game as well. The Hawks, of course, played tonight in Indiana and they pulled out a very nice win. 113 to 111 at the last second. John Collins with a tip in with 0.7 seconds to go. Uh the Hawks were up. Double digits at one point. They were down double digits at one point. They were definitely up and down, up and down. They were down late. They were resilient in this one. It was not pretty all the way around. It was certainly against an undermanned Pacers team. But in the end, any road win in the NBA is a good one, particularly against the Pacers team that's playing pretty well. And the Hawks weren't perfect on this night, but they pulled it out of the fire. And uh, that was definitely a big win as they also face a back-to-back on Saturday in Toronto. At any rate, we will dive in now to the first story, the bigger story, even with a close-fought memorable game on Friday, is the massive uh, bombshell, you could, you could say, you know, palace intrigue, however you want to kind of say that, from Sam Amick of The Athletic on Friday morning. The first thing I'll kind of say to set the stage a little bit here is I got, I got two texts on Friday morning before I even checked in with anyone in the wake of the Amick article, article on The Athletic. One was not suitable at all for podcasts, and I really can't share. The other one referred to the Hawks, and uh, this is, uh, I'm quoting here, a bleeping bleep show. And the uh, words were actually used rather than the bleeps in that context. These, these are people that are really actual real people from, from around the league, not just like Hawks fans or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of uh, thought around the league in recent weeks and months that the Hawks are kind of a disaster behind the scenes. That was not exactly calmed down by the reporting that came out from Sam on this Friday. I'm not going to go through the entire story line by line. I would certainly encourage you to read the full text of the story. There is no substitution, even with my context, to going through and reading all of the story. It's behind a paywall. I'm going to respect that to some degree. It's one of those things. But it basically backs up a lot of what I've been saying repeatedly on the show about the front office turmoil and the general mess that's going on behind the scenes with the Hawks for the last few months and even beyond that. So we'll start here. Anik refers to Nick Ressler, of course, the son of Tony Ressler, as someone, quote, who has had increased influence on roster and staffing decisions since really the end of 2020. This is not a new revelation. I've talked about it a few few times on the podcast. If you've been listening to the show, you definitely will know that by now. But still the most prominent piece of written content that expressly lays out all of this with regard to to Tony Ressler and his son, Nick. Sam was also the first person, and I actually talked about this on, on the podcast as well, he said on, on a Ringer NBA podcast recently, basically that you know it's common knowledge that Nick Ressler, who by the way is 27 years old and uh, is the son of Tony again, has a, has a lot of clout in the organization. That's been well known behind the scenes. It's now becoming well known in front of the scenes in recent days. He also wrote the following quote: "Nick Ressler's effect on this on the decision making process played a pivotal part." End quote. When it comes to the exit of Travis Schlenk, speaking of that. And Travis Schlenk's exit happened, you know, about a month plus now uh, away from this moment. Amick lays out what many have suspected and that Travis Schlenk basically does not have any kind of role anymore with the Hawks. He's on the payroll, but according to people, according to the piece, I should say, he is, quote, no longer part of Atlanta's operation in any way. Any way. I have heard the same after making some calls. Uh, that's been confirmed. He's on the masthead. He still has a senior advisor title. He's getting paid, but uh, not part of the day-to-day is what I'm hearing at this point in time. Uh, also, there were some references to Ryan Silverstein and Grant Liffman, who are close friends of Nick Ressler and... Ledger Fields um, individually. Silverstein is on the cap strategy and administration side. Um, Liftman was a former media member over in, uh, in in Golden State and around the Bay Area. He was hired last year. He's reportedly tight with Ledger Fields, et cetera. And also part of the, I guess the bigger like, kind of news thing from the reporting was that Kyle Korver, quote, may be headed 
end quote, for assistant GM role with the Hawks. And shortly after that was published, Woj reported that a deal is being finalized between the Hawks and Corver for that number two job in the front office. Corver, by the way, being in that role is not out of the ordinary. It's kind of a quick rise, but he's been around for a while, of course, with, with the team before. He was previously in the hybrid role between the staff and the front office as the director of player affairs and development. Also, Jake Fisher reported on a Friday that the Hawks are, quote, looking to add more former NBA players, end quote, to the front office. There's much more to come in that way beyond Corver, according to the reporting from Jake. Not inherently bad, but you also don't want to just hire former players to hire former players. So I'm not sure what the uh, approach is there just yet. But and I just want to say this for the record. I, I really like Kyle. I've always liked Kyle. He was great to cover when he was around with the Hawks. I was covering the team back then. It's been a while, obviously, but I was around every day during that sequence. Um, and really, he's highly, he's highly respected around the league as a great voice, knows how to play, knows how to convey information, good communicator, et cetera. He's certainly considered to be a potential GM candidate down the line beyond just the Hawks, like a big picture around the league candidate. It's a little bit early potentially for that, but there's nothing like weird about him being a, a number two guy in the front office right now. That's, that's a very normal kind of thing. Just want to push back on any notion that that's kind of a weird thing. I think that's kind of pretty normal compared to everything else that's going on in the story. I think the biggest single bomb in the Anik piece is the reporting that Travis Schlenk, quote, was expressing his concerns, end quote, about the price for the Jante Murray trade back over the summer. And, and here's the big one. Nick Ressler was, quote, known to be a driving force behind the deal, end quote. If true, that is not good. In fact, it's really bad. You have a president of basketball operations who's the, the number one guy in the department, only under Tony Ressler, of course, the owner. And the owner's son seemingly pushes through, or at least tells push, push through, a massive franchise-altering chips in the middle kind of trade. That is not a great look by anybody involved. Uh, Sam also referred to Nick Ressler's power as, quote, a growing issue internally in recent months specifically in relation to Trey Young. And by the way, Trey also wanted DeJounte Murray, which is part of the deal as well. Uh, the last thing on the Palace Intrigue side is that Amick talked to DeJounte and Trey and John Collins when the team was in Sacramento last week. And there's nothing huge in any of those exchanges. I'd recommend reading all of them, of course. The one that stood out to me the most probably was Murray saying that, quote, there's, there's a lot going on that's non-basketball, end quote, with, with Atlanta. And then later he also said that there is, quote, more than where I came from in San Antonio where everything was just not as loud, end quote. Didn't seem like thrilled with how it's going. Nothing like crazy either from DeJounte or John or Trey. And, you know, as far as the normal stuff, there was Sam reporting on the price for Collins kind of dropping in recent stage, recent stages. I think that's probably something that I could echo. There's conflicting information out there. On one hand, I've heard um, through the grapevine that the Hawks actually may be a little bit less motivated to Trey, Collins, to Trey Collins. And on the other hand, it's maybe more motivated. So conflicting sources is certainly not ever something I'm going to go crazy about. I think the urgency level is probably a little bit higher right now because the team isn't winning. Of course, they won tonight. But basically, I think it's as likely as ever that he's moved. But we'll see how that all goes in the next few weeks for the deadline. And overall, what I'll say is this. I've been trying to relay the organizational turmoil for a while. This is great reporting from Sam to get it locked down enough to write. But I'm just going to say it. It's a terrible look for the franchise. This is not good. None of this is good. Even Steve Coonan on the radio, who has pushed back in the past to some reporting and is kind of tasked as the CEO with being a sunshine and rainbows kind of guy, he even acknowledged that this is a lot of this stuff is true. And it's not going well behind the scenes. And I don't know Nick Ressler personally at all. This is not a negative thing about him individually, in my view. I'm not going to be you know bashing the guy. I don't have a great idea of his basketball knowledge, et cetera. But the idea that a 27-year-old owner's son who doesn't have a background in leadership or the leadership level title. He's not the GM. He's not the even the assistant GM, et cetera. He has a title, but not a high level title. And he's, if he's driving huge decisions, that's bad. Obviously from the outside, that's not a good look. And also it's a bad look for Tony Ressler, who's the head of the team and the managing partner, not the only owner, but certainly the, the governor of the team to allow all that, all that to happen. And his reputation is also out there for kind of meddling on the basketball side. That isn't going away either. Combining all of that with luxury tax avoidance policy, that's another strike against him. And having all of this happen with Schlenk in the middle of the season, uh, especially in the middle of, of what, I, what I would describe as a pivotal season after you trade for Murray and all that stuff, it's all it's all brutal, honestly. Again, even Coonan said it was fair in the article and the reporting. So I know there are some Hawks fans always that want to push back on anything that's reported nationally as like you know, fake news or whatever. This is, I think, pretty true from what I can gather all the way across the board. So that does not mean, of course, that the Hawks can't pull out of this in the future. Maybe Landry Fields can grab hold of the wheel and execute some strong stuff in the coming months. Um, right now, there isn't a ton to be encouraged by behind the scenes. We haven't even gotten to the part of the story where what, the DeJounte thing. Uh, DeJounte's hitting for agency in a year and a half, and the Hawks pushed a bunch of chips in the middle for him. 
and they're below 500 half the season. It's not great. I don't, I don't want to pay, paint a dire picture. I'm accused sometimes of being too negative. This year, maybe a little bit too positive because the team's been playing poorly. I'm usually somewhere in the middle uh, trying to give you all the context necessary. But this story is damning enough where my, my phone's been blowing up for the last basically day straight about all of this stuff from people around the league, kind of in awe of the dysfunction behind the scenes with the Hawks. So there is a path to, to success on the bright side. You want to kind of in, in on a higher note. The Hawks are not void of talent by any means. They still have a franchise guy in Trey. They have another top 40 guy in DeJounte. They have a bunch of guys who were, I think, top 80 to 100 players and Capella and Collins, et cetera. Plus Griffin showing a lot as a rookie. They have a lot to thread the needle, though, at this point in time. And um, through 42 games this year, they've not played all that well, even with a win tonight. So big picture, this is a very bad look. No one looks good here from almost almost across the board for the Hawks. And uh, we'll see what else comes out. But um, some stability would be very nice at this point in time. So maybe just some quiet here moving forward wouldn't be the worst thing in the world. But at the end of the day, uh, not a great look for anybody there on a Friday uh, in mid-January as the season is halfway over. And we'll have more on that in the future, I am sure. All right. On to the game, but first, a word from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. As a small business owner or hiring manager, you can success in 2023. All depends on the team members that you surround yourself with. And that's why LinkedIn Jobs is a fantastic option for you. With LinkedIn Jobs, you can hire qualified candidates more efficiently by matching the open roles that you have, people who have the skills, the values, and experiences to help you achieve those goals. I've used LinkedIn Jobs a few times in the, to hire in the past. It's proved to be an awesome resource for me. It makes the entire hiring process easy and painless. They help you to quickly attract the most qualified candidates to your open jobs with targeting tools. And they make it easy to screen and rate applicants based on your job qualifications all in one platform. They also go beyond the resume data by using insights from your job posts, your company, and the millions of member profiles that they have, but put your post in front of the most people and the most qualified candidates that they possibly can while do it quickly, and they do it for free. We all have goals in the new year, and having our people around you is huge in making all of that happen. It's well, this is LinkedIn Jobs number one and delivering quality hires when compared to leading competitors. LinkedIn Jobs also helps you find the most qualified candidates that you want to talk to, and they help you to do it faster. Post your job for free. LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA. One more time, that is LinkedIn.com slash locked on NBA. Terms and conditions apply. All right, we'll dive into the game now. And the Hawks, as I said before, did win this one 113 to 111 up in Indianapolis. The Pacers were shorthanded, which is important context here. Tyrese Halliburton was out, their best player, their potential all star guard. Miles Turner was also out, their second best player and their best big man. Also, Aaron Neesmith was out. Now, that's obviously a lot less important than the other two guys, but Aaron Neesmith has been starting for them and is a decent player. So down three of their key guys, including easily their top two players. That's a uh, great context. Now, the Hawks were down an important piece too. Capella is still out, nine games in a row for Capella. Nate said on Thursday that Capella has been running and getting better, but is still feeling something that's not all the way ready in that calf. Went on to say that they're not going to risk a setback with him. I think some of that might stem from the fact that Capella came back once before and re-aggravated the injury in the first game back. So a little bit of extra caution probably in that circumstance, but we'll see if he's available on Saturday. He is on the trip. Keep that in mind. But bet online, our friends over there made the Hawks three and a half point favorites on the road. That's pretty crazy for the Hawks to be three and a half point favorites on the road against a team that's pretty decent in Indiana without Capella is stark. And it does, it does kind of tell you that, in, that Indiana does uh, sort of lose a lot without Halliburton and Turner um, as for the game itself. So, Early on, the Hawks started out this game well. It was 12 to 4 in the early going. Trey Young, nice to have him back after a one game absence. He had a three early on, had two, two quick assists in this game. Akangu was awesome in this one. He started out very early and often. He had a block and a dunk early on. Um, rebounding wise, it was his best game of his career. But the Hawks dictated the pace quite a bit in the early going. But uh, it was a lots of back and forth. And early, uh, Isaiah Jackson of Indiana established himself. He had seven blocks in 28 minutes in this game. He was flying around on the interior. The Pacers had a 14-4 run, take the lead in the middle of the quarter. Uh, defensively, it was a little bit kind of hit and miss. The numbers, as we'll get into later on, were not that bad, but they had some real like glaring issues with transition and point of attack defense, et cetera. Collins had a rough start in this one. He uh, actually played very poorly the entire game until the very, very end, of course. But Indiana had 18 points in the paint early on. Rotationally, no surprises for Atlanta in this game. It was a nine-man rotation. No, no Kaminsky in this one. They didn't need him. Indiana played very small. No favors, no Justin Holiday. It was a pretty standard rotation against a small team without Capella. Um, the Hawks actually missed a bunch of free throws early on in this game, but there was another big run in the first quarter. 11-0 by Atlanta. Take the lead. The last four points in a row from Okongwu off passes by Trey. That was good to see. They had a few stops strung together. They attacked the paint, and that coincided with Trey being on the court at that point in time because Trey was uh, good really the entire game. The Hawks were good when Trey played and bad when Trey didn't play, and that was really the case the entire way in this one. They were up 90 in the first quarter, and the big thing was Okongwu had 14-8 and in the first quarter, uh, his best quarter of his career by the numbers. 
14 points and eight rebounds in a quarter play the entire quarter. He was awesome. And offensively, the Hawks were brilliant in the first quarter. 36 points and 25 possessions, plus 14 with Trey on the floor. Um, they shot the ball very well at six threes in the first quarter. It slowed down from there. That was their best offensive quarter of the entire game. Um, the one kind of crater was the second quarter of this one where they were playing uh, the remote rotation, but Indiana started out very well. 16-5 to five run with Trey on the bench. Um, four turnovers in the first six minutes of the quarter for Atlanta. They took three or four just – Horrible shots, one from Hunter, I think one from Murray, one from Bogey, kind of just stagnant in that time. They stayed in that kind of mid-range with the tie back and forth, back and forth for most of the quarter. And they were down by three at the break because Buddy Heald hit a three with two seconds to go in the first half. But the, the offense crater, they had 19 points in the, in the second quarter. They shot 31 percent from the floor. They had four turnovers. It was kind of just a mess. Um, and basically, you know, Kong Wu had 18 and 13 in the first half. His first double-double in the first half of his entire career. He tied his season highs in scoring and rebounds in a full game. And he did it in the first half, which is pretty crazy. Um, after halftime, it was kind of a mess. There was a couple big runs. A lot of really the entire second half was marked by big runs. Um, Pacers scored the first four points of the third to go up by seven. Then the Hawks had a 14-0 run in the middle. They had four threes in a short period of time. They were getting up threes and making them. Trey made or assisted on all four of those. He had a double-double pretty early on in the third quarter. They held the Pacers down to four points. Uh, I thought DeJounte was really bad in the first half and then uh, sort of found his legs in the second half at 10 points in like a seven-minute period beginning the third quarter. Uh, Hunter was more aggressive and more assertive in that third quarter as well, using his physicality and his size to kind of get uh, great advantages around the rim and elsewhere. Unfortunately, though, Hunter and Murray had 24 of the 29 points in the third for Atlanta, and not a lot else went well. In that period, it was a 15 to two run, by the way, by the Pacers at the end of the third quarter. And uh, Trey, the only the only two points there were Trey free throws at the very, very end to stop the bleeding. But they were down by five going to the fourth quarter, turning the ball over, giving up defensive issues along the way. And um, the fourth was like kind of more of the same. Now, they ended up winning it 29, 22, but that was basically all at the end. Um, down eight to two with a, with a run early in the fourth quarter, capped off by a three by Buddy Heald. At that point, they reached minus 18 in the minutes without Trey Young on the floor in this game. Trey played 37 minutes. So they were minus 18 in about 10 and a half, 11 minutes with Trey on the bench. And that almost lost them this game. They went back to Trey earlier than usual. They kind of had to at that point. It was the right decision. It worked out well. He had five points in a row after that when he catch two, and a catch two three and, and some free throws. Nate went crazy on a no call that I kind of thought was funny on the bench. I'm surprised he didn't get, he didn't get he sort of didn't get a technical foul at that point in time. Um, but there was a big run, 11-0 by the Hawks midquarter to hit the lead. Hunter hit a 6-3 of the night to cap that run. That was a new season high, and I believe it tied his career high for the pointers in the game for DeAndre. And uh, the Hawks did go cold after that for a second. They missed four straight threes after the Pacers took a, a sort of took, took a four-point lead. The Hawks also went small to close until the very end. They brought Collins back. I'm not sure if Collins was banged up or just that Collins was playing badly because he was. He was bad in this game, but the Hawks went without him. And I usually hate that. I didn't mind it as much in this one. Um, out of a timeout, Murray got a decent look, but they basically traded some buckets, traded some buckets. Murray made some free throws, and they took the lead with 2.08 to go on a bucket by DeJounte in transition. They got, they got a stop from there, but then a Ben Matherin three-point play chance gave the Pacers the lead with about a minute to go. He missed the free throw, but that was actually a big shot missed by Matherin. Collins missed a bunny at the rim after that that he's got to make, honestly. The Hawks kept the ball after a loose ball. And then Trey hit a huge shot, a step back three to go from down by one to up by two, about 30 seconds to go in the fourth. Um, Buddy Heald then drove and drew a foul to tie the game. Uh, he made both, and the Hawks got the ball with 21 seconds to go. No timeout from Nate. I didn't mind that because Trey was on the floor already, so no issues there. Uh, I will say Trey took a very bad shot. Now, I will praise Trey in a moment and say that Trey played very well in this game. The Hawks were... Great when he played and bad when he sat. I'm not piling on Trey, but only the shot at the end was a terrible shot. He took a 31-foot pull-up in a tie game with five, with five seconds to go. Um, the only bright spot was that he took it early enough and he missed it badly enough. The ball went right to DeJounte Murray, so that was fortunate. Murray missed the jumper rebound – sorry, the, jump, uh, the jumper, but he attempted right after that. But it was just enough time for Collins to tip it in with 0.7 seconds to go. And it, again, it was ironic because I think it was probably his worst individual game of the entire season for John Collins. And I think I've always been high on John. He was terrible in this game for the most part. Um, but a huge play. And after a review, that actually it was not over. 0.7 seconds to go were, le were left, but Indiana was unable to get a shot up to the rim, and the Hawks escaped with the win. So uh, we're getting into some numbers in a second, but uh, I will just say this. It was a lot of roller coaster stuff in this one. The first quarter was really good. Second quarter was a disaster. And then even within the second half, while it was basically the Hawks were plus five after halftime, it was a lot of highs and lows all the way through this one. 
Um, there were good performances. Uh, as we'll get back into a second from now, Akangwu and Trey. Um, Hunter in the second half, I thought was really good, etc. There were some rough ones between Bogey and Collins in particular. Um, there were some challenges defensively. We'll get into those numbers. But uh, again, a, a gritty win, I would say. A win that the, probably the Hawks should have won easier in this game. They were the better team on paper. But it still counts as standings as a victory. And we'll get into all of what transpired in a second with some takeaways from this one, some player evaluations, and more. But first, it were from our sponsors on the show today. Today's show is brought to you by Bet Online and the NBA is the central focus of this podcast. Of course, these are very, very busy in 2023 and with plenty of football, including the NFL playoffs. Of course, they have hockey and soccer and other action going on as well. The action never stops at Bet Online, and they're the number one source for sports betting information, your stats, and your news this season. Get the latest odds and trends for every pro and college league out there at Bet Online. That includes the latest in the NFL and basketball and soccer and esports and golf and tennis, auto racing, horse racing, entertainment bets, and much more. Bet Online is also very useful, engaging the latest on the Hawks. That includes the point spreads and the total and the money lines to each and every game, plus player props and futures market stuff on the championship odds, division odds, title odds, all that fun stuff. And individual awards are very popular this time of year in the NBA. Bet Online is also the fastest and easiest way to get your sports betting fixed. And if you love sports podcasts, you can find those at Bet Online as well. Check out Bet Online on mobile device or a computer to learn more about all the trends and the action in the sports world. Bet Online, where the game starts. All right, and some overall uh, numbers and takeaways from this one on the Hawk side. Um, Let's just say the offense was a mixed bag. Ended up with a 116 offensive rating, which is a very good number. Um, I do think the Pacers, in their current form without Miles Turner, are a pretty bad defensive team. They play pretty small, pretty offense first in this one. And the biggest thing for the Hawks was making 16 threes, which the Hawks have not done much at all this year. In fact, as of, I believe, today, I'm checking this now, um, the Hawks, I believe, are the are dead last in the league in three-pointers per game. So they are really low volume. They're a bad shooting team this year. They were 16 of 33 for three that is a huge factor they took a lot of threes they made a lot of threes and kudos for that um down the stretch good ball security two turnovers in the fourth quarter 14 for the game is just like an okay number but i was good enough they were really going on the offensive glass in this game as well and then 19 fast break points not usually a huge strike they, they were good there and they, i will say they were legitimately good on offense when trey was on the floor in this game when he wasn't it was not good but overall they did enough on offense um the defense was roller coaster i will say they in a vacuum only the numbers, a 111 defensive rating is totally fine, especially without Clint. Um, but And there were some highs, like nine block shots. Um, they did have the Pacers shoot seven of 30 from three, which is somewhat the Hawks and somewhat just bad shooting by Indiana. I think if you look at just the average output from the Pacers' shot quality, they would have scored more points than they did in this game. But um, some breaks there. On the margins, though, it was pretty rough. They allowed 29 free throw attempts. That's a lot. 64 points in the paint, that's a lot, and 30 fast break points. Uh, just for some context there, the Pacers currently lead the league in fast break points, so that's important to point out. But usually it's Halliburton pressing the, that advantage, and they only average 19 a game. So the lead leader has 19 a game, and they have 30 in this one. Still, it was enough on both sides of the floor, although neither side was great in this game. Uh, as for the players in this one, um, nine guys have played, like I said before. Aaron Holiday was the quietest. He had no points and w- did have two blocks, which is a little bit funny for a 5'11 guard. Uh, had a steal as well. I think defensively, he was their best point of attack guy in this game, at least on the perimeter. Um, maybe maybe Hunter was in that mix as well, but as far as the guard size players. But offensively, he was basically a zero in this one. Um, Jalen Johnson had some good minutes. Seven points, five rebounds in his 14 minutes. Had a steal and a block as well. They have two turnovers. His lows are very low sometimes, but also his highs are very high. So Jalen wasn't as good as he was the other night when he was awesome on Wednesday, but he was still pretty solid this game. AJ Griffin was okay. Eight points on eight shots, not super efficient. And he was minus 17 in this game. He played most of his minutes with Trey, off, with Trey, with Trey on the bench. The Hawks have tried to get AJ on the floor to help out Bogey and Murray with some more juice. It didn't work in this game. I don't mind that as a process, but he didn't have his best performance. And then Bogey was very quiet as well. Four points on nine shots, just didn't have any juice. Defensively, he was bad. Um, I think he was actually worse than Collins, even though John played his worst game of the season. Bogey was pretty damaging, I thought, in this one. Um, As for Collins, seven points, eight rebounds, did have a steal and a block, four fouls. He was only minus two, um, but two of nine from the floor. He was one of of seven on twos. That's usually a 60% plus um, proposition for, for John missed two free throws just didn't have it in this game just some weird ball security stuff some weird finishing challenges around the rim um, defensively he still helps them but um, offensively it was a mess from John you know obviously kind of a one game sample size because if you look at the numbers this year there's been a lot of talk about how John's been quote unquote bad on offense it's really just the jump shooting and now that that that, 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 that definitely matters but if you look at all everything else 
his two-point shooting has been fine all year. It's been just the jump shooting. And th- this game is actually one of two on threes, ironically, but um, one of seven on twos, and that's uh, going to have to be better for John. Obviously, it's kind of a one-off. You don't worry about him finishing around the rim or doing whatever, but he was pretty bad until the very end of this one, and obviously a huge play in that final possession. Uh, we'll save a comment for the end. Uh, Jonathan Murray was bad in the first half, like outwardly bad, I thought, and the second half was good, actually. 18 points, eight rebounds, and six assists in this one. For DeJounte, he did need 18 shots to do it, so he wasn't very efficient, but he was more in attack mode after halftime and was more effective. I thought his defense was better and more uh, more aggressive after halftime, which probably helpful. Uh, Hunter had a interesting game, had 25 points on 18 shots, made six threes. That was pretty much the entire output for DeAndre was the six threes, and sometimes they sometimes they go in. I don't think he played like fantastically, but he made shots. And that's kind of they had to have that at some point from somebody in this game. Trey. I thought it was really good, despite going over six on two. So kind of a weird one there. He just kept missing his floaters in this game, but he had 26 points, 11 assists, and two turnovers. Plus 20 in the game. And again, plus 20 in the game. They won by two. So minus 18 with him off the floor. And I thought he was great. I mean, the only thing that I would quibble with at the very end was that was the pull-up jumper with five seconds to go. But um, before that, made six threes, got the line nine times, good passing. He was under control. I thought it was a, a really good game from Trey. It wasn't like his best numbers game in the world. He, you know, averages more ta- more points than this sometimes, but I thought he was really efficient and really good in this game. Uh, defensively, he was challenging as he usually is with TJ McConnell, et cetera, but offensively, he was really in control the entire way. And then Akonwu, I thought it was probably his best game of his career. Uh, 18 points to tie a season high. 20 rebounds is a career high for Nyeka, including 13 defensive. He played 39 minutes. He had four assists. He had four blocks. He had two steals. He was flying around. He was 9-12 from the floor. Uh, Akangwu, look, it was a good matchup for him, and that Indiana was playing small and no, like, huge bulking center, which is what he struggles with. But he was really good in this game. He was flying around, plus 19. Uh, he and Trey were definitely the driving forces on the two sides of the, fl- of the floor in this one. And uh, kudos to him. Obviously, he's had some shakier moments this season. Uh, but as the days have gone on, he's gotten better and better during the season. I think Kongwu ha- had sort of a big one in this game. And obviously, the Hawks don't come close to winning this game without him having a huge night. So kudos to Onyeka, who played very well in this one. Okay, that's it for the game. Um, last thing is that the Hawks go to Toronto on Saturday. It's a tough back-to-back. There's customs in between. That's, uh, for those of you who have never done that, even when you're flying private like the Hawks do, it takes a little bit of extra time. you got to get into the hotel and do all that fun stuff. And also, the Raptors didn't play tonight, and they were and they were at home on Thursday. So it is definitely an advantage for Toronto schedule-wise, home court-wise, et cetera. Also, the Hawks got blasted in Toronto on Halloween night. That's a, It was a rough one for the Hawks. Um, they've been disappointing this year, the Raptors staff, but still a matchup that is uh, definitely going to be a challenge for Atlanta. As a programming note, I'm actually not going to have a podcast on Saturday night. I usually have maybe one, maybe two games a year where I don't do a immediate post-game reaction because of logistics and all that stuff. I don't love doing that, but it's just kind of unavoidable sometimes. And you can take my word for it. I can't do a podcast tomorrow. It is what it is. If something crazy happens, a trade or something like that, I will do my best to have a show at some point. But part of the reason is that I won't record just on Sunday about that game is because the Hawks play at 3.30 on Monday for MLK Day. So that quick turnaround doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So basically the plan is going to be I'm going to do a little bit of coverage on Saturday night's game on the Monday show on the Hawks Heat wrap-up about MLK Day. So please subscribe to the podcast. I will do both games in one on Monday afternoon slash evening. And if the world ends again, I will spring into action. You can find my written work as well, patreon.com slash BT Roll. I wrote about some stuff the other day. And uh, obviously a full busy day on this Friday into a holiday weekend. So please Check out all that stuff. Please subscribe to the podcast. Tell a friend about the show. Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Odyssey app, uh, all those places. Google Play. We're also on YouTube. And it's a huge favor to me if you were to subscribe and auto-download across platforms to, to support the show in that way. Also, follow us on Twitter at Lots on Hawks. Follow me on Twitter if you'd like to at BT Roland. One more time, patreon.com slash BT Roland. I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll have a full wrap-up of Saturday and Monday after that, uh, and uh, really, I sincerely hope, hope you guys enjoy this back-to-back and really a challenge for Atlanta on Saturday and then a little bit more of a friendly atmosphere on Monday that we'll get into later on. But Raptors on Saturday, Heat on Monday, and we'll have it all broken down by Monday night. Stay tuned, and we'll see you next time.